Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. good. Everybody, uh, welcome to this exciting session of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, my name's Joe Gorowski. I'm the founder of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. You can see behind me, I have some students from my school who are pretty excited to be joining in. Um, looks like what do we have? We've got some grade fives joining us today. Um, we uh, are so lucky to be joined by uh, Adventure James Ketchell today. So um, he is a great guy. He's had to overcome some pretty tough challenges, um, but he's used that as motivation to explore the world and see some of the cool things the world has to offer. So before we move on to uh, James, I'm going to very quickly introduce our two classes. So I'm turning your mic on, our class in San Jose. Fifth grade students, Fifth grade wave students, wave high students, wave high students. And then just and then the just the grade eight class is joining us. Toronto, how's it going, Grano. everybody? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right, all right. So we are school in Guelph, Ontario. We've got some grade fives hanging out for the session. James, without further ado, I'm going to let you take over. Thank you very much. And firstly. Good afternoon, guys. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to, for you guys to join me today and, and let me speak to you. Uh, I hope that you like stories because I'm going to take you guys on a little bit of an adventure. But in order to do that, I need to turn the clocks back eight years. And you're probably thinking, why on earth do you need to do that? Well, eight years ago, I used to race motorbikes. I was pretty good. I used to race most weekends. And what you're looking at now is a Kawasaki ZX6 Ninja. It's quite a fast bike. It would max out at 173 miles per hour. Now, the problem that I had, when I was racing, I was quite competitive. And I didn't really like losing. But the problem you have on two wheels is you're either winning or you're pushing so hard that you crash trying. And unfortunately, I used to crash quite a bit. But it's okay because you wear this leather suit and that green suit that you can see is actually made out of kangaroo leather and the idea is that when I fall off the bike I can slide along the floor without losing all my skin which is obviously quite useful but there was one particular time I was accelerating hard out of a corner uh, the guy in front of me was just pulling away from me and I went a little bit too fast and the rear wheel lost traction so the back of the bike just span up and it came round on me and it threw me over the handlebars at just over 100 miles an hour. And I remember time just slowed down. As I was flying through the air looking back at the bike, I thought to myself, oh dear, this is going to hurt. And I just remember hitting the ground hard and it knocked me out. And then I came to at the side of the track and a doctor came over to me and I had this really intense pain running through my leg my right leg and he said to me whatever you do don't look down now what do you do when someone tells you not to do something you do it no doubt so of course I looked down and instead of my foot pointing forwards I'd snapped my ankle and my foot was 180 degrees behind me and I remember that day the doctor slid my boot off that I was wearing and I had a white sock on and where I'd had an open fracture, so the skin had split, my white sock was now drenched in blood and was red. But I still had a sense of humor in the face of adversity because I said to the doctor, oh, wouldn't this make a great photo? And he turned around to me and said, stop being such a silly boy. So I said, oh, I'm sorry about that. And then the next thing I know, they started injecting morphine into me and I just disappeared into another world. And then all of a sudden, I woke up in hospital, and not only had I broken my ankle badly, I'd broken my legs, and I'd broken my arm, and I'd broken my hand. So I had a cast all over me, literally, and I couldn't do a thing. I had to have a nurse wash me. So it wasn't all bad in some respects, I suppose. But it was quite interesting at the time. And ever since I was a young boy, I've always had this dream to try and row a boat across the Atlantic Ocean but I've never really had the guts to pursue it. And it was whilst I was lying there in hospital and the doctor said to me, listen, James, you're really going to struggle to walk properly again, let alone do anything of you know, the physical sort of sports that you have been doing. 
And that really hit me hard. And I thought, right, I've got to have something to aim for, something to work towards. So I set myself a goal, and that goal was to row across the Atlantic. And I managed to make that happen in 2010. Now, you're probably going to look at that photo and think, gosh, you look pretty different, but my hair goes blonde in the sun, and for some reason, my beard goes bright ginger. But we all know that being ginger is cool. So behind me there, you can see a little island called Antigua, and that's in the Caribbean. And I rode, from the, tradi I rode the traditional mid-transatlantic route from La Gomera in the Canary Islands to Antigua. Now, in actual fact, that's the same route that Christopher Columbus used when he discovered the Americas back in the 16th century. And he had 80 crew working on his vessel with him. Now, when you do this type of thing, you usually row in a pair. So a two-man boat, a four-man boat, an eight-man boat, or a ten-man boat. Now, I have no idea why no one would join me. So I decided to do it on my own. It was probably the best decision I ever made. So when you come out of the Canary Islands, this whole mass of ocean called the Canary Current is flowing down the side of Africa. And as it gets to a lower latitude, so that means closer to the equator, it then picks up the North Equatorial Current. And again, the whole mass of ocean is flowing across towards the Caribbean. And then the trade winds start filling in. And the idea is you're riding on these winds and these waves to get you across. But when I went across in 2010, it was a particularly tough year. There was a lot of areas of low pressure which would switch the wind direction and would end up blowing me back. So what I thought was going to take about 70 to 80 days ended up taking 110 days, 4 hours and 4 minutes. So almost 4 months. Now I'm going to show you guys some video footage from out uh, in the Atlantic. So hopefully you don't get seasick and vomit your lunch up everywhere. Let's find out. Now you can see the boat is moving up and down. And this is very much a standard day. Some of the waves would really be as high as a two to three story building. So when you see a wall of water coming at you at that kind of height, it's really quite frightening, but the boat is designed to self right so if it does roll over, it'll just come back up again. Hopefully, I'm still inside at that point. But so many people used to say to me, oh, I bet it was so boring being out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, because all you have is this vast blue ocean in the sky, which is true, but it's the most magical place you could ever be. Every morning, the sun comes up, and the water glistens in a different way. It's incredible. And the wildlife is something I'll never forget. Huge, huge fin whales, which were the size of a double-decker bus, would swim up to the side of the boat. And I would almost look them in the eye. And they are just so huge. Sometimes they'd swim up underneath the boat, and as they come up, my boat would slide off the back of them. I'll never forget that. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen the film Life of Pi, but flying fish really do fly. It was one o'clock in the morning. I'd been rowing all through the day, and I was very, very tired. And all of a sudden, this white object came flying out of the water, and it hit me in the face. And I thought, what the hell was that? I was so tired, I thought I'd just been hit by a golf ball. But then I thought, Oh, surely I'm not going to get hit by a golf ball out here. And of course it wasn't a golf ball. It was in fact a flying fish. And the left-hand side of my face was completely slimed up. And I looked down on the deck and I could hear this flapping. And, and it, it was this fish just flapping up and down. And I thought, ah, okay, what do I do with this fish? Do I try and eat it? Well, not really because it's pretty small and pretty bony. So I threw it back in so it could hit someone else in the face another day. Now, one of the things that was absolutely incredible in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is getting out of the boat into the water, which sounds like a crazy thing to do, considering I'm on my own. But I used to get out of the boat and clean the bottom of the hull. If I was to keep the bottom of the hull clean, the boat would move through the water that little bit more efficiently 
and a little bit more faster. So if I could gain just half a knot over every hour, over every day, over every week, that small marginal gain would become massive. So when I get out of the boat, straight away, what hit me is how clear the water is in the middle of an ocean. You look down and it just goes dark because it's three miles to the bottom. So you're never that far from land. It's just the wrong way. And underneath the boat, there's an incredible ecosystem of fish. You have big, small fish, big fish coming up to eat them and so on. And there are literally hundreds of fish swimming around everywhere. And one day I was cleaning the bottom of the boat. And I was scraping it and just getting it nice and smooth. And all of a sudden, this fish, I don't know, it's probably about the size of an average ruler, swam right up to me. And it bit me right on the nipple. I couldn't believe I'd just been bitten on the nipple by a fish in the middle of the Atlantic. It didn't really hurt. It was just like being pinched. But I'll never, ever forget that. Now, as you can see, I'm coming in here. Now, this place that I'm rowing into is very famous. It's called Nelson's Dockyard in English Harbour in Antigua. It's very, very famous. And I'm about to take my last stroke on a 3,000-mile row. And watch what happens to my oar gate right now. Watch this. Did you see that? The way that the gate that holds the oar in place actually snapped. And I couldn't believe it snapped on the last stroke of a 3,000 mile row. What were the chances of that? But luckily I had a spare, so I didn't need to use it. Now if you keep watching guys, something quite funny happens. And no, I don't fall in. Champagne in the face is really, really painful. Especially when it goes in your eyes. You're much better off drinking it if you're old enough of course now I'm a true believer that when you push yourself outside of your comfort zone and you try hard doors of opportunity will just naturally open and it was during my preparation for this row that I met someone who became a very good friend of mine he was also rowing the Atlantic but at a slightly different time and of course in a different boat and we helped each other out and worked on our projects and just became good friends. And he said to me, James, after the row, would you like to go out and climb Everest with me? And I said, well, gee, I'd love to, but let's take one thing at a time here. We've got to get across the Atlantic Ocean. And he said, yeah, OK, that's fair enough. And I'll never forget it. When I got home, the phone rang and it was my friend Rob. And he said to me, James are you coming out to Everest? And my instant reaction was, yes. So I said to him, yes, I'm in. And then he said to me, well, that's great. You've got six months, so half a year, to find $60,000 to pay for it. And I thought, crikey, that's a lot of money. How am I going to raise that amount of money? And getting sponsorship is the hardest part to any expedition, so raising the money to make it happen. But I had this concept, this idea, that when I crossed the Atlantic, if I did one thing, and that one thing was just to keep going, by default, I would make it to the Caribbean, as long as I didn't row in circles. So I thought, well, that concept, that idea never really failed me. So if I take that idea of just keep trying, be persistent, surely someone is going to sponsor me. And I managed to get lucky and I managed to raise all of the funds to get out to Everest in 2011. And this is where the journey starts. It's one of the world's most dangerous airports. It's called Lukla and it's built into the Himalayas. The Himalayas are the world's largest mountain range. It's, it's incredibly huge. The range itself runs for about 3,000 miles and is home to the world's tallest mountain, Everest. Now, the photo doesn't really do it justice, but you can see the angle of the runway. And at the end of the runway, it's a sheer drop off the cliff. So I was quite anxious when you fly in on these very old planes. But it's quite ironic that I'm trying to climb the world's highest mountain 
and it starts with a trip into the world's most dangerous airport. So this is the first glimpse that I got of Everest. As you can see, it's still very green and lush, and right up into the distance is the summit, the top of Everest, the world's highest mountain. Now, in order to get up to Everest, we have to walk through the Himalayas, and this particular section is called the Kumbu region. And everything is carried by porters here. We can't just go and get in the car and drive to the supermarket because that doesn't exist out here. There's no roads where we're going. So everything has to be carried. So this guy has got Pepsi on his back. He's carrying it up the trail. But this Pepsi, this weighs almost 200 pounds. So he's got a huge amount of weight on his back. That's like carrying me on your back all day long. But he'll still have a smile on his face at the end of the day. And whenever I feel sorry for myself, I always think back to these guys. Because when you think you've had a tough day, there'll always be someone else out there who's had a much tougher day. And it's the Nepalese people that make the Nepalese uh, country so, so amazing. So this is a bit of a breakdown as to how we go about climbing Mount Everest. You can climb from two sides, the south side via Nepal or the north side via Tibet. Now, where I climb from the south side, it's broken down into camps, as you can see. We have base camp, camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four, and the summit. Now, we can't just turn up at base camp and make our way up to the summit. We have to go through a process of acclimatization climbs. So we go from base camp up to camp one, back down to base camp, then up to camp two. We stay there for a night, and then we come back down to base camp. And then we go back up to camp two to go up to camp three. Then we come back down to camp two, and we're going up and down and up and down. And each time we go back up, we go that little bit higher. And that's allowing our bodies to build up a tolerance to the lower levels of oxygen as we go higher up. So this is what base camp looks like. It's a real hub of activity, but for every one person climbing, there's a huge support team in place. We have doctors out there, we have cooks, we have sherpas, we have porters. All of these guys have their own very important roles, but we all come together and work as a team, and that's how we're able to stand on top of the world. This is my tent here at base camp, and you can see we're looking up at the Kumbu Icefall in the background, and that's the most dangerous part of the climb, and you'll see why shortly. So you can see this person here, he looks very small in all of this ice around him, and this is the Icefall, and this whole area is very unstable, and it's constantly moving and shifting. And if this was to collapse on you, you'd have a big problem. So the idea is we get through the Icefall, as quickly but as safely as we can. Now that can be quite tricky because we're walking along these metal ladders that the Sherpas put down because the ice, where it's moving and cracking, it opens up these huge gaping holes and we have to cross them by these ladders. But it takes a bit of getting used to, but after a while it's quite easy to walk across them. But some of them are quite deep, like this one here. So the trick is not to look down and just Look where you want to go and take one step at a time. But some of the ladders can actually get quite long, like this one here. This ladder is, is uh, probably the length of your classrooms that you're sitting in now. It's five or six, I think it's six ladders lashed together to get across. Now I'll show you guys some video footage when I cross this. Now if you look carefully, you're going to see the way the ladder moves up and down like a trampoline and it buckles and twists from side to side and I'm pretty scared at this point because if you look down you can't see the bottom it just goes dark and what you can't see in this frame here there's about 25 Sherpas all just sat there watching me so everyone's eyes are on me as I walk across this ladder and I'm thinking to myself oh gee please don't fall and I went back to that that theory that I have just keep going look where you want to go and just keep putting one foot in front of the other and that'll eventually get me across but it was just my luck that I got stuck 
And in a second, you're going to see I'm trying to move, and I can't. So right now, I try and move my right foot, and I'm stuck. My crampons, which are the spikes on the bottom of the boots, have got wedged into the ladder. But I stayed calm and managed to get across. It looks quite easy when you watch the video, but I can tell you it's quite different in real life. So these are the Sherpas. These are the guys that are the real heroes of Everest, or any high-altitude mountaineering expedition for that matter. So all of this equipment here, they'll be carrying up and down the mountain. So the tents, the oxygen, the food, the gas for our cookers, these guys live and work in the mountains, and they're an incredible bunch of people. This is Lakpar Onju. He's very famous out in Nepal. I think he's summited Everest 10 times now. This is Dorji. Dorji and I uh, stood on top of the world on the 16th of May 2011 for about 15 minutes. Now, Dorji is an incredible Sherpa. I think he's stood on top of the world 11 times now. And I owe Dorji a lot because as I was coming back down off the mountain, I became very sick. And it was Dorji that got me back down off the mountain. So I owe a huge amount to him. He's a, he's a great, great guy. So this is the section, once we've gone up and over the Kumbu Icefall, this area is called the Western Kum, and it's very flat. But one of the things I noticed in the daytime, the sun was coming up, and where we're quite high, the atmosphere is very thin. So the sun was very, very powerful. So the sun's rays are coming down on my face, and they're also reflecting up off the snow and the ice. So it's like having a sun below you. So the insides of your nostrils get burned and the roof of your mouth gets burned and you get burned in places where you've never been burned before. It's really quite interesting. Now, it's not my best photo, but that's what I looked like after I got down. This was just after I summited. And you can see there's a combination of the snow, of the, the wind and the sun just battered my face. But uh, thankfully, I don't look like that anymore. So we're going a bit higher now. This is what Camp 2 looks like. So the novelty of snow has long worn off. No one's playing snowball fighting or building snowmen because we don't really have the energy. We just get into our tents and we just stay nice and calm and relax. After that, we're going to start heading up the Lhotse face, which is, wow, probably nearly 3,500 feet in height, 4 to 5 uh, for about a 45 degree angle. It's quite straightforward because the Sherpas will fix a line into the mountain and we can use that line to pull ourselves up as well. So not only are we using our legs, we're using our arms to get ourselves up. And eventually that'll get us up to camp three. And you can see the angle that the tents are dug in here at. So it's not the kind of place you want to go wandering off once you get into the tents. But you can see the Sherpas are coming up and they have these huge loads on their backs. These guys are carrying about 100 pounds in weight, and that's made up of oxygen canisters, food, and various supplies to go up and down to the different camps. And their, their ability to deal with the lower levels of oxygen is far superior than most Westerners. These guys have never seen the sea before. They live and work at high altitude. So following on from Camp 3, we cut across the Lhotse face, and that takes us up over this area of rock, which is called the Yellow Band. And sometimes it can be quite dry. You don't always get a lot of snow on Everest if it's a dry year. So that means there can be a lot of exposed rock, which can be quite tricky with your crampons slipping and sliding. But eventually that will get us to Camp 4. So we're now in what's called the Death Zone. So we're above 8,000 meters. So we're very, very high up. And the, body, the human body is no longer acclimatizing. We're actually slowly dying. But we can sustain this altitude for about 24 to 48 hours, which is just enough time to get up to the summit and back down. And you can see the oxygen canisters on the bottom left corner there. We'll be using those. And the oxygen is coming up through the red tube here into the mask. And I'm breathing the atmospheric air that's around me the oxygen is just topping me up, and it makes a big, big difference. So now there's a bit of a strategy. So we're at Camp 4. So what we're going to do is actually climb all the way through the night in the dark under head torch 
to arrive on the summit in the morning so we can get back down in the daylight because getting down is a lot harder than going up. So when we left Camp 4 for hours, this is all we could see, just our head torches illuminating the area in front of us. But Everest itself, climbing from the south side, can be quite demoralizing because you, as you're coming up the south summit or the south face, you can't see the true summit. And as you get to this point where this photo was taken on the south summit, the rest of the mountain just opens up in front of you. And you have to climb along this long, thin, exposed ridge line. And I'll show you guys a little bit of footage from that. So you're now looking at maybe a one and a half mile vertical drop so we need to be very careful what we're doing at this point. But you can see the view is just fantastic. And if you look very closely on the left, guys, you'll see the very thin ridge line that we're walking along. And that ridge line is the width of your chair. So if you're not good with heights by this point, you might have a problem. It's really difficult filming at this altitude because it's so cold. The batteries freeze up on the cameras and just everything is tricky. Now what you're looking at here is the famous Hillary step. Over 60 years ago, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay hauled their weight and their bodies up over this last piece of rock to make it to the summit. They are the first people to stand on top of the world and get back down again to tell the tale. And it was really quite an amazing feeling walking in those very same footsteps as Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. So this is what it looks like to stand on top of the world. You can see we're looking out now, we're looking actually south, out over Nepal, and India would be in the distance. Almost 200 miles away we can see, that's how far the horizon is. And we can actually just make out the curvature of the earth. So you get an incredible view from top of the world. So the camera is panning north now and you can see this area of cloud cover and that's um, covering an area called the Tibetan Plateau and in the distance is actually China. Now this mountain that's coming into view now which is in the center is a mountain called Makalu, the fifth highest mountain in the world. It was very very windy at this point which made things quite tricky but I still managed to take a few photos so this is my favorite photo I, uh, I look like Darth Vader out of Star Wars and to be honest you wouldn't even really know that's me but just to prove that's me there you go the ginger beard comes back and I look pretty old and pretty tired and you can see it's pretty cold as well as my beard is frozen but I realized something at this point I realized that I was only halfway and I still needed to get back down and I had a huge amount of adrenaline and excitement rushing through my body and it was that that powered me to the top of Everest and when I got there that feeling that excitement that adrenaline just left and all of a sudden I lost the ability to breathe I was really struggling with my breath catching my breath and on the way back down I could only take one to two st steps without actually stopping and Dorji was saying to me you've got to keep moving you're moving so slow that you're gonna get stuck here and run out of oxygen but I didn't know what was wrong it turned out that I had a severe lung infection but I didn't know that at the time now thanks to Dorji I managed to get home but I still couldn't breathe and I mem remember walking through the airport with back in London, back in England, and my mum and dad had come to see me to welcome me back. And I was pushing the trolley through the airport, and I saw my mum, and she waved at me, and I waved back, and she said, James, you look terrible. And I said, well, it's great to see you too. But I'd lost so much weight, I was so gaunt in the face, and I was so out of breath that I must have looked awful. So we decided it was a good idea to go to the doctor's. And I remember I, I went to the doctor that day and he said, James, go to the hospital right now. You are really quite sick. So I said, OK. And I went to the, the hospital that day. And uh, I'll never forget this. They x-rayed my chest. 
and they put the x-ray up on a whiteboard in front of me and they said Mr. Ketchell you have severe pneumonia you're lucky to be alive we're going to need to keep you in hospital to pump the, the antibiotics through you and make sure you're okay if we don't take control of this now you could deteriorate and become critically ill so the day I got back from Everest was the day that I then spent almost a week in hospital and it was a feeling of deja vu having already been there before and I was lying in hospital and I thought to myself wouldn't it be a great idea to cycle around the world so I went off and I started to raise all the funds to make that happen and in 2013 on the 30th of June I set out from London a very famous place called Greenwich Park which is where time starts and I decided that I was going to cycle all the way through Europe, India, Asia, across Australia, across America and that would be my route. So the first day all of my friends joined me here and they cycled down to a town called Dover where I hopped onto a ferry and crossed the English Channel into France to a place called Calais and then all my friends went and they left me and I was on my own so I was cycling unsupported so that means I had no one following me and I was doing everything on my own the cycling itself was actually quite easy but the unsupported element of it made things just that little bit harder so the first few countries that I went through was uh, France, Belgium, Germany, Czech Republic, Poland Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Turkey. And then when I got down to Turkey, I had to uh, I had to fly over uh, Iran and Pakistan to get into India. Now you're allowed to fly when you cycle around the world because you obviously can't pedal across the oceans. So I flew into India, and India is a magical, magical place. As you can see there, I'm at the famous Taj Mahal, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. I really wanted to take my bike into this place, but uh, they wouldn't let me. So one of the things that I did do in every single country was I didn't want to be just another British lunatic fulfilling my own dreams. And I do a lot of work with young people. And I had a goal, and that was to speak in a school in every single country that I visited. And I managed to do that and spoke to over 10,000 young people as I went around the world. This is another school in Bangalore. They came out and met me and I cycled in. It was a, a fantastic day. After, after India, I headed over to Sri Lanka and cycled a lap of Sri Lanka. Then after that, I headed over to um, Thailand and cycled all the way down through Thailand, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur and Singapore. I was almost struck by lightning okay, in Malaysia here. So I needed to take some shelter and then I realized that I was stood underneath a metal bus stop which was not too smart. These people thought I was absolutely crazy talking into a camera. You'll see them now. They wondered what I was doing. But as you can see, I'm trying not to get the camera too wet, but it's, um, my God, it's seriously raining very, very hard. Far too hard to cycle, and the roads are flooding out, and it's actually pretty dangerous. But it's kind of better, and it's quite exciting, I suppose. So, so one of the biggest days that I pushed was from the city of Kuala Lumpur to Singapore. And I thought it was going to be about 200 miles, but it worked out at 262 miles. And I was on the saddle for just over 20 hours. It wasn't too bad, though. I was able to cover that kind of distance because I was very selective about the kit that I took with me. I traveled very, very light. And you can see on, in these small bags here, this was my entire life for half a year. It took just under half a year to get around the world. Now this bike is quite special to me. Now one of the things that I was doing before I cycled the world was I was doing a lot of work in schools. And teachers would say to me, you know what, sometimes the kids, 
They like to think that they need to have the best trainers, the best phones, and the best of everything. And some people can't always afford that, and you don't even need to have the best of everything. And so I decided to prove that, and I proved that by cycling around the world on a second-hand bike that I bought for £300, and I've still got it now, and it took me all the way around the world. So you do not need the best and the most expensive of everything to go away and do something cool. After Asia, I flew across to um, Australia, and this is the famous Nullarbor Plain. It's about a 700-mile dry, barren desert, and this is quite a famous road. You may have seen this before. Now, one of the things I found out this day, that I actually filmed this particular piece of footage, I noticed that there were all of these bottles of orange stuff at the side of the road, and I wondered what it really was. And then I realized that it was truck drivers. They were, for whatever reason, they were not stopping to go to the loo, so they would wee into these bottles, and they'd throw them out the window. But in the heat of Australia, really made these these bottles of wee stink and as I was cycling along I could hear the roar of a truck coming up behind me so I turned my shoulder and turned my head to the right and all of a sudden this object came flying out of the, the cab of the truck and it hit me on the side of the arm and it was a bottle of wee but the guy hadn't put the lid on it and it just covered me and so I was drenched in this guy's wee, and it was disgusting. I wasn't too happy about it, as you can imagine. But I'm not sure if he did it on purpose, but I'm a true believer in what goes around comes around. Luckily that night, I was able to get my clothes washed at a truck stop, and um, it was all good. So after the famous Nullarbor plane, that took me across to a place called Port Lincoln, and then down round to Adelaide, then to Melbourne, then to Sydney, and then all the way up to Brisbane. And it was at Brisbane that I then flew across to America, to San Francisco. Just cycling across the Golden Gate Bridge. I was determined to do it. Here I am. So I cycled all the way down Highway 1, the, one of the world's most famous highways that hugs the Pacific Ocean coastline and it was absolutely incredible cycling. That would eventually take me down to Los Angeles and San Diego. Once I got down to San Diego, I needed to figure out how to get across. So I then crossed out over through California into um, <clears throat> Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And one of the things, by this point, I'd been on the road for a good sort of four months and I'd lost so much weight but thankfully in America it's very easy to eat and I won an eating competition out there actually and the guy could not believe where I was putting all this food but when I explained I was cycling around the world kinda made sense I was burning maybe six or seven thousand calories a day and I could literally eat what I want it was absolutely incredible but one particular day in Texas I was chewing a sweet and my tooth cracked in half and it was extremely painful so I had to find a dentist who was going to repair my tooth for me I managed to find one in, in um, a place called El Paso and I turned up at the dentist and the first thing he said to me was why on earth are you wearing cycling kit and I said to him well I'm cycling around the world and he said right well that explains why you stink and I said oh I'm terribly sorry about that and he said, never mind, come in and sit down. So I sat down and he repaired my tooth for me. And all of a sudden, he went off and disappeared for about half an hour. And I thought, where is this guy gone? And I think he'd gone to Google me to perhaps make sure I was telling the truth about who I was and what I was doing. Because he came back and he said, James, I love what you're doing. Um, and because of that, I am not going to charge you for the work. And it was going to be a thousand dollars to have my tooth repaired. And luckily he didn't charge me. So I laughed and joked with him that the healthcare system in America is great, 
all you need to do is cycle the world and you'll get free treatment. One of the things that I did do is I took a photo of every single person that I came into contact with that made a difference. And this is what the dentist looks like. But as you can see, it's really difficult smiling when one side of your face is completely numb. But he was a magical guy and he fixed my tooth and that enabled me to carry on. So from Texas, I then went out into Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, then into Florida. And from Miami, I flew to Lisbon. And from Lisbon in Portugal, I cycled all the way up through Spain, France, back into the UK. And I remember on one of the, well, actually the last day I arrived back into England. And all, as you can imagine, it rains a lot here. And the day that I get back in the morning, it was pouring down with rain and I was still getting punches. And I was pretty, pretty disappointed because I thought to myself, well, none of my friends and family are going to come and see me finish back in London now because it's pouring down with rain. But I learned something as I went around the world. And that was never, ever give up because you never know what's around the corner. And it was almost as if someone was looking down on me because a few hours later, the clouds parted and it was beautiful blue sunshine. And I crossed the finish line in Greenwich Park and my friends had come and joined me and it was a magical, magical day. And I remember that day, it was February the 1st, 2014. When I crossed that finish line, someone said to me, do you know there's nearly 10 billion people on this planet? And you are now the first and only person that's rode an ocean, summited Everest, and cycled around the world. Now, to be honest, it was only a combination of three things, but it was quite special at the time. But I remember looking back to when the doctor said to me when I was lying in my bed in hospital with broken legs, you may not be able to do the things that you want to do. And I look back on that and I think, if someone says to you, you can't do something, if you want it enough and you're prepared to do that one thing and that one thing is just keep going, you will always get what you want or where you need to be. And I also learned that if you treat people in a way that you would like to be treated, good things will come your way. And it was quite amazing what came my way a few years ago. I was about to cycle around the world when I was speaking at a scout group and someone said to me, James, I want to row across the Indian Ocean. And I said, I think that's absolutely fantastic, but I want to do it with you, he said. And I said, right, well, I'm about to cycle around the world, but maybe we'll pick this up when I get back. But I remember one thing, actions speak louder than words. This guy went off, he built a website, he started trying to obtain funds, and he displayed the actions of someone that really wanted this. And when I found out about his background, he'd had Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a type of cancer, at 19 years old, and he almost died. It was his third round of chemotherapy that saved him. And he had epilepsy ever since he was a young boy. And all his life, people said to him, you can't do this, you can't do that. And all he wanted to do is prove to people that just because you have epilepsy or a bit of a disability, you can still do things with the right mindset. So we, we decided to head out to Australia. And I had this gut feeling that this was, this was the project that I should work on with Ash. So this is the boat that we used here. This photo was taken in London in a place called the Docklands. And this is what Ash looks like. He's a, he's a great, great man. But uh, the row didn't quite go to plan. We were leaving a little place called Geraldton in Australia, and we were trying to row to Mauritius, a distance of almost 4,000 miles. And we got caught in quite a nasty storm. Now, these boats are designed to self-ride. They're designed to ride out this rough weather. But unfortunately, we had two large waves hit the boat, and the boat rolled twice. And the second time the boat rolled, Ash was violently thrown in the cabin and hit his head. And at that point, he was knocked out and we had a medical issue on board and we had to get rescued. And I remember it was probably one of the scariest situations I've ever been in because we were too far out for a helicopter to pick us up. 
So it was a 100,000 ton crude oil tanker that picked us up and getting onto it was incredibly difficult. But we managed to make it up and I'll show you guys some video footage from the rescue. One of two British rowers rescued twice of WA isn't ruling out another attempt to row from Geraldton to Mauritius. The man and his partner were pulled from heavy seas 11 days ago and taken to safety by a ship. A painstaking climb to safety. In rough seas, James Ketchell and Ashley Wilson make it to the top of a 100,000 tonne oil tanker. Ashley had a head injury. Immediately medically assessed, his first request, fruit juice. Orange juice, orange juice, orange juice, orange juice, orange juice, or panica, panica water, panica water. Able to crack a smile now, hours earlier, a six metre swell struck the rower's boat, rolling it. You don't really know what's going on. Things start spinning very quickly. Whilst we were inside, Ash hit his head quite hard and uh, unfortunately we, we then had a medical issue on board and, and at that point I had to put safety first. A distress signal went out immediately but it was two hours before Dubai Charm made it to them. It's something I will never ever forget. We could see it coming as it got closer and it's really quite an intimidating feeling when you see this huge just ship just coming straight towards you. The rowers are professional adventurers. Their trip from Geraldton to Mauritius across the Indian Ocean, a bid to break a world record and raise money for epilepsy research, a condition Ashley suffers from. This was their second failed attempt. It was disappointing, but I think we've got to look at this in the bigger picture. We've raised a huge amount of awareness and funds for, for our charities, and we've escaped with, uh, we're able to tell the tale. And it seems their latest dramatic ocean trip may not be their last. Are we going to try again for a third time? I would say to that, that you never know what's around the corner. Watch this space. <laughs> you can donate to epilepsy research at www.nothingsimpossible.co.uk. Alice Pooley, Nine News. So as you can see there, guys, that's what happened out in Australia. But sometimes, no matter how hard you try, things don't always go your way. But that doesn't matter. As long as you just keep going, everything works out in the end. That's one thing that I've learned. Now, guys, I could keep talking to you for hours because this is what I love. But I'd like to say thanks ever so much for listening to me. And if you've got any questions, please fire away. So thank you ever so much, guys. All right, James, that's, you know, uh, you joined my class last year, and so I've heard the story before, and this new edition, I mean, it just doesn't get old. I love listening to your adventures and your tales from um, out and about in the world. So uh, let's start off with a qu uh, two questions from each classroom, and then if the classrooms still have time, let's do uh, a couple more. Does that sound good? Yeah, it's perfect. I can, right. 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 you know, go well, ahead, you know, go well, ahead. San Jose, go San ahead. Jose. Go ahead. Hello. Do you have any siblings? Do I have any, have any siblings? Okay, okay. I do have a brother, yes. His name's Jeremy, and he's a little bit uh, younger than me. He is, how old is he? I'm 33, and he is 26. And he works for Mercedes Benz, and he's very normal. Most people think I'm crazy, but um, yeah, I have some siblings. What about you? Two older sisters. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, let's go okay, one let's more question. One more swing back, back if you have more time. Have more time. Okay. How did it feel to accomplish climbing Mount Everest? How did it feel, did it feel to accomplish climbing Mount Everest? Well, at the time, it was a bit of a bit of a And it wasn't until I got home that I was lying in hospital and three or four other doctors that I'd never met in my life came up to me and they shook my hand and they said, James, I just want to say well done on climbing Everest. And I thought, well, how do you know that? I, I, I don't know you. And it was really at that point that it sunk into me 
that I just climbed the world's highest mountain in the world. But um, I suppose it was. It, it certainly was a good feeling. Um, but it was all it, 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 at the time. It, it took a long time to sink in. I was uh, very tired and very fatigued and quite um, pretty knackered actually. So uh, at the time, it didn't really sink in. But uh, when, when, when I got back, I, it was it was a good feeling. All right, awesome questions. We'll swing back in a moment, guys. Um, let's visit our class, our class for a couple of for questions. A couple of questions. Hey, guys. hey, guys. Hi. Hello. Hello. We're, we're wondering what you were like when you were young. Well, that's a, well, very, that's a very... What was I like when I, like when I was young? Okay. Okay. So I, I always out and about, going on little adventures, building camps and various bits and bobs. Um, always getting into some kind of mischief which I certainly don't condone but it's very important to find out what you like and what you love and when you find find out what you love you take that and you run with it so I found out that I love going away on expeditions I somehow have a knack for surviving and telling stories uh, so I'm not doing anything special I'm just taking that and I'm running with that so Find out what you love and just take that and run with it. And um, I learned, I suppose I learned that when I was a little bit younger. Um, but um, yeah, I was just very normal, really. A bit like Dennis the Menace, I suppose, doing, always getting into a bit of a mischief. But I was a, I was a good boy, I think. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's grab one more question. One more question. So what somebody was asking if you have any regrets on this path that you've taken. Wow, that wow, is a that is a question. Do I have any regrets? No, not really. Um, hey, actually that's a very good question because I wish I'd started doing this slightly earlier because my first expedition didn't start I think I was about twenty six when I rode the Atlantic. So in some ways I wish I'd started when I was twenty one or eighteen. But apart from that I have no regrets, no. One of the things that I absolutely love is sharing stories with people like yourselves and try to perhaps encourage other people to get out there and pursue their own goals. It doesn't matter what you do. You don't have to be an adventurer, but find something you love and just go and do it and do it as hard and as you can and to the best of your abilities. Okay, awesome questions, awesome answers. Um, so we've hit the hour mark, but uh, James, are you okay if we maybe swing in yeah. for one more wrap-up question? Carry on. I've got plenty of time. Yeah, okay. Let me check in with uh, our San Jose class. San Jose class. Do you have time for a yeah. question? We, I actually need to uh, get these guys out. Two of my classes have already walked out to go back to their rooms, but we just wanted to say thank you for James for his time and what he shared with us. All right, awesome, right, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, whoops, oh, my mic whoops, was off. My mic was off. Let's try on one more time. There we go. There we go. Um, um, you guys have maybe one or two wrap-up questions for James? Um, what was your favorite adventure? Okay, what, okay, was, my, what was my favorite adventure? I think my favorite, think my favorite adventure was probably, I mean, they're all so different, but probably rowing across the Atlantic because to me that felt like a real adventure because I was on my own, I was making the decisions by myself, and I was self-supported. So everything I had to do was on my own. And when you're out in the middle of an ocean, like being in the middle of the Atlantic in a rowing boat, the closest people to me, unless there was any commercial shipping around, were 230 miles above me in the International Space Station orbiting the Earth. And I found that just fascinating. So it's fair to say it's quite remote out there. And I love being out in the Atlantic and just being out in the ocean in general. So. I think the Atlantic was was probably m my favourite, but um, certainly Everest was by far the hardest, 
and cycling around the world was um, was also a lot of fun as well, but very different. So, guys, you tell me what you want to do. What's your dream expedition? expedition? <laughs> Wow, you wow. want to go Yeah, so, yeah. so they, were wild, wild. they were incredible. incredible. In Australia, in the Indian Ocean, I saw a lot of humpback whales because it was migration season. So they were coming up from the south, heading north to warmer waters, and they were just amazing. So that sounds like a great idea. Adventures. Who has some adventures with them? Okay, Keenan, we have a we have a co-op student here who's who's our musical genius. Wow, wow, that's cool, that's cool. Hey, uh -huh. um, hey. I want to walk across New Zealand. You want to walk? You want to walk? Yeah, yeah. That is, that, 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 that. So I think, so I think, I think. What's that? I think you need. I think to you need. To and get the guys in the class to help you. Yeah. <laughs> Have any of you been? Have you guys been to London? To London? Anyone been to London? Oh, one. Oh, one. Oh, one. Oh, one. Oh, one. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, James. You are a true inspiration. What a value! Those experiences are to us and to adults and students around the world. Thank you so much for generously sharing, for putting together such an amazing slideshow and showing us that video footage. Fantastic. And no worries, I think no worries. your message is so powerful. Thank you. Also, okay. Okay. thank you, Joe, for coordinating this. Absolutely. What a wonderful um, gift to education you're providing. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, you, thank know, you. know, we're just getting started. Getting started. So, um, um, all the credit all goes, the credit to, goes to thinking is time. Time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Look forward to more adventures together. All right. All awesome. right. Awesome. If you're uh, interested, um, oh, sorry, Joe. Oh, sorry, if you're interested, you're interested in, um, follow me across the Atlantic. I'm going across the Atlantic in January. This time in a pedalo, so it should be really exciting. Um, you say so you can just check out the website, or Joe will share the information with you, and, and you guys can send me messages out there as well if you like. Okay, very cool. That sounds awesome. So, um, yeah, I guess we've come to the end of our session, James. That was phenomenal. And um, to our class still joining us, our grade eights from Toronto, you guys had some awesome questions, and um, like James says, get out there and do some adventuring. So, James, if you want to say something in closing, then we'll let the class. Say goodbye, and we'll sign off for today. Okay. Well, guys, I'd like to say thank you ever so much for having me. And there is one thing that I just want you guys to remember, and remember this at all times. You guys are no different to me. Every single one of you out there has the capability to do whatever you want and be whoever you want. You only do that one thing, and you just keep trying. So... Keep going, guys, and hopefully I'll be able to listen to some stories from you guys one day. All right, so I'm turning your mic back on. Guys, if you want to say thanks to James, and we'll sign off. Thanks, guys. All right, signing All right, off. Signing thanks, off. guys. It was a great session. That really was wonderful. Thank you.